So we're looking at Matthew 7, 15 to 29. Now, it's always important to look in at the context of Bible passages. And in this case, it's important to look at the context of what Jesus is teaching as he makes his way through the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, 6, 7. So we'll pick up the context from the beginning of chapter 7. In chapter 7, from verses 1 to 6, Jesus is speaking about making sure that we judge people and situations correctly. And in verses 7 to 11, he's speaking about the importance of asking God to fill us with the Holy Spirit. So if we put those two teachings together, we can see that Jesus is encouraging us to judge people and situations through the Holy Spirit and to therefore to be filled with the Holy Spirit to enable us to do that. And then in verses 12 to 13, we find that Jesus is speaking about how to judge through the Holy Spirit is difficult. It's like going through a narrow gate onto a hard path and few people manage to do that, but it leads to life. So to make correct judgments, to discern correctly, is difficult and hard, but always leads to life. So we put all those teachings together. The context is discerning, judging truth, judging ourselves, judging others, judging situations through the wisdom and power of the Holy Spirit, though that is a difficult thing to do. It's a thing that always leads to life. So that's our context, and it gives us a real springboard into verses 15 to 20, where Jesus is speaking about false prophets. So if we pray, we're speaking with God. If we prophesy, we're speaking for God. Prayer is speaking with God. Prophecy is speaking for God. So a false prophet would be someone who is falsely speaking for God. So they appear to be speaking for God, but they're actually not. And Jesus says, beware of these false prophets. And he gives us some information on how to, how to know that they are false prophets. He tells us in verse 16, you will recognize or know them by their fruits. And again, in verse 20, he says that again, thus you will recognize them by their fruit. So how do we know that a prophet, someone who claims to be speaking truth, someone who claims to be speaking on behalf of God, who is the ultimate truth, how do we know they're false? How do we know that they're speaking on the ground of Holy Spirit truth? How do we know? By their fruits. If their fruits are rotten, if their fruits are bad, they are false prophets. They have entered through the wide gate. They're on the broad road, the easy option that leads to destruction. The things they say may appear to be attractive or logical, and the things they say may be popular, but those things, what they're saying, where they're coming from, is going to bring destruction. It's destructive. So Jesus, in those verses, talks to us about false prophets and how to discover them. And then in the next section, 21 to 23, he speaks to us about false Christians and false ministers. Not everyone, he says, who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who's in heaven. He's speaking about those who enter the kingdom of heaven. And he's saying, obviously, there are some who claim that Jesus is Lord, but they will not enter the kingdom of heaven. These are false Christians. And there are others who do amazing, mighty works in God's name, in Jesus's name. But Jesus will say, on that day, the day of judgment, depart from me. I never knew you. So what is it about these Christians, so-called Christians, these ministers, that means they're false? Jesus never knew them. They had no genuine relationship with him. And if there's no relationship with Jesus, there's no love for Jesus. And if there's no love for Jesus, then they're going to live and act 
in a loveless way, in other words, a lawless way, because the law of God is the law of love. So we have false prophets who can be detected because they are bearing bad fruit. And we have false Christians, false ministers who can be detected because they have no genuine relationship of love with the Lord Jesus Christ. In both cases, they're false. Now, let's remember the context is correct judgment, correct discernment. Jesus is helping and teaching us to discern and judge correctly between what's true and what's false in terms of the people that come our way. Then, in verses 24 to 27, Jesus speaks about the person or the people who hear what he's saying and who do what he's saying. The person who hears and who does. And that person's life, that person's judgments will stand. But the person who hears what he has to say, the person who's even beginning to discern correctly but doesn't then act upon it, that person's life, that person's judgments will not stand. And then we finish up in verse 28 that Jesus finishes all these sayings. This is the whole Sermon on the Mount. He's finishing up. And the crowds are astonished at his teaching. Why? Because he's not teaching them like the scribes. He's teaching instead as someone who has authority. And why does he have authority? Because he's not only speaking words of God, but he's speaking them by the Holy Spirit. There's authority to these words. So we can wrap up the whole message of certainly this chapter of the Sermon on the Mount and look at it through the lens of proper judgment. It's interesting if you go back to the book of Genesis, chapter one, and we're told, we're given these six days of creation. On one day, God creates one thing. On the next, he creates another thing. Distinct, different things. Immediately, you have one thing being distinguished from another. Then you get into chapter two, you have Adam. All the animals are brought to him to give names. And in order to name those animals, he's having to distinguish between them, to judge between them. The ability and the need to judge, to discern between one thing and another is absolutely crucial to who we are as human beings made in the image of God. God is a God who judges. He judges and distinguishes between good and evil, right and wrong, truth and falsehood. The ability to judge, to discern, to categorize is absolutely fundamental. So it's no wonder that Jesus would spend so much time talking about it and he would show us how to do it. And the way to do it is to listen to his words and tune into the Holy Spirit and then act upon what we see and hear. And it's as we come towards the end of this chapter that this importance of acting on our good judgments really comes to light when he speaks about the man who hears his words and does them is the one whose house is built on the rock, whereas the one who hears the words but doesn't do them is the one whose house is built on the sand. So that's a quick flyover of these verses we're looking at tonight. Um, We will dive in a little bit more deeply to them in in a moment, but just as a slight interlude, a friend of mine celebrated their birthday today, so I went round to their house to give them a gift, and this friend said to me, oh, would you like to see my my collection of snails. I said, sure, because I know that this man is a taxonomist. And if you know what taxonomy is, taxonomy is classifying creatures into their different groups. And that's his, that's his whole background, his whole training. So he took me into his garage and sure enough, boxes upon boxes of snail shells and mollusk shells, seashells, boxes upon boxes, all classified into their, I don't have the correct words, but their groups and their subgroups, and all with their Latin names. And he began to take some of the boxes off the shelf and show me, this one's from China, this one's from the Philippines. I collected this one on a beach in somewhere in the Caribbean. All these different incredible variety of shells, and each one had a story. And there were literally thousands in amongst other creatures, which I won't mention what they were because they weren't particularly nice. 
for other creatures that he, he collects, but it's because of his love for the variety in nature and his gifting, really, to, to study that and to classify it. I could tell he was enjoying showing me these things and it was enjoyable to look at them. The innate need to categorize and classify. And it's so important in a world that's so complex and it's even more important in the world, let's say the spiritual world, that we can categorize between what is true and what is false. And hence Jesus's emphasis on this. Okay, so what I'd like to do is just look a little more closely at some of these verses. So if we go back to verse 15, I'm going to read 15 to 20. In fact, Richard, would you read 15 to 20 and then I'll read it as as well. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will recognise them by their fruits. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? So every healthy tree bears good fruit, but the diseased tree bears bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus you will recognise them by their fruits. Thank you. Let me just read that again. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will recognise them by their fruits. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? So every healthy tree bears good fruit, but the diseased tree bears bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus, you will recognize them by their fruits. Okay, so if we look at verse 15, he says, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. Who do they come to? You. To you. He's speaking to his disciples, by extension speaking to us. He's saying they they come to you. These false prophets, they come to you. They're not just going to the world, they're coming to you. And we could think of all the different ways that false prophets could come to us, especially in this day and age of communication. They come to you. Then he says, they're wearing sheep's clothing, but inwardly, they are ravenous wolves. So you have this contrast between the clothing they're wearing, what they seem to be, but what they are inwardly, what they actually are inside. And what are they actually inside? They are ravenous wolves. This word ravenous, it means to take something by force, by plunder. They've come to take and not give. And they've come to destroy. The effect of what they're doing is to destroy and not to edify. They may appear like a sheep, harmless, even cute, but they are actually wolves. So how do we, how do we discern them? How do we tell the difference? Well, we're going to have to look, be able to see what's going on with them inwardly and not just what's on the surface And that will require us to take a heavenly perspective. Man judges by the outward appearance. God judges by the heart. God looks at the heart. So if we listen to the word of God, if we're tuned in to the Holy Spirit, then we will be able to, we'll be in a better position to recognize these ravenous wolves, these false prophets. But Jesus makes it even easier for us because he says in verse 16, you will recognize them by their fruits by the outcomes and the results of what they're doing, what they're saying. Now, this word, to recognize, you will recognize them by their fruits. It's a word that means to to know accurately or to know thoroughly or to know well. So Jesus is saying, you will know them accurately by their fruits. You'll know them thoroughly by their fruits. You'll know them well by their fruits which implies that we can know them in a basic sense even before we look at their fruits. We can begin to discern by the Holy Spirit and to see something's wrong here, something's wrong. 
But to know them well, to know them accurately, to know them thoroughly, we're going to be looking at their fruits. We're going to be looking at the outcome of their message and of their presentation. We can have a very clear sense of a false prophet purely by being well-versed in the Bible ourselves and listening to the Holy Spirit. But we can thoroughly know that false prophet by looking and examining the fruit of what they're doing, what they're saying, where it's leading. And that's what Jesus is instructing us or telling us to do here. And he's reminding us that a healthy tree won't be bringing bad fruit, but a bad tree won't be bringing good fruit. So what will happen to these false prophets, these unhealthy trees? He says in verse 19, every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. In other words, it's useless to God. It can't be used for anything. It's under his wrath because it's a tree that's full of falsehood and untruth and evil motive. And these are the false prophets that he's talking about. Even Satan, the Apostle Paul tells us, can masquerade as an angel of light. Even Satan himself can appear as a minister of righteousness. So Jesus is giving us some really good tools here to discern and judge what's coming our way. So then he goes on, 21 to 23. Not everyone who said to me, Lord, Lord, when does the kingdom of heaven? But the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, we did not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do much work in your name. And then I will declare to them, I never knew you depart from me. Okay, so we're moving on here from simply false prophets. We're moving on to false Christians, false ministers of any kind. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. So these so-called Christians or ministers, they are saying to the Lord, Lord, Lord. They're calling him Lord. So is that good fruit to be calling Jesus Lord? Well, Jesus says not everyone who does that will actually enter the kingdom of heaven. So it's clearly in itself not enough. It has to be someone who's doing the will of the Father in heaven. What else are these people doing? They are prophesying in Jesus's name and they are casting out demons in Jesus's name and they're doing many mighty works in Jesus's name. But he's still gonna say to them, depart from me because they're not doing the will of the Father in heaven. And what is the will of the Father in heaven? Well, the clue would be in verse 23, I will declare to them, I never knew you. The will of the Father in heaven is to know us, is that we would open our heart wide to God and be in that relationship with him. Then we can be filled with his love and we can do works of God's law, works of love, rather than having our hearts closed to him and therefore not having his love in our hearts and therefore being workers of lawlessness. So basically, these people, although they're calling him Lord, Lord, they're prophesying, they're doing, casting out demons, they're doing mighty works in his name, their heart is closed to God. Their heart is not wide open to God. He doesn't know them. In other words, he's not having an interaction with them. Okay, and therefore... There's no love in their walk and in their ministry. Lawlessness is the opposite of love. The law of God is the law of love. So lawlessness is the opposite of love. There's no love in their ministry and in their walk. So we can pretty easily see what good fruit should look like. It should look like a heart that's open to God and a life that's being transformed by his love, that's demonstrating his love. Okay. So false prophets, false believers, false ministers, how to discern them, look at the fruits, look and see if there's a heart that's wide open to God. And look and see 
if there's love in their ministry and in their, in their life. The love of God, that is. Okay, you with me so far? So let's press on into the next section, verses 24 to 27. Everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on a rock. And rain fell and the floods came, and winds blew and beat on that house, but it did not fall, because it had been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. Thank you. Excellent. Everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat against that house and it fell and great was the fall of it. What's the difference between these two men? What does Jesus say is the difference between these two men? One has strong, good foundations and one doesn't. One has strong, good foundations and one doesn't, correct. What is it that has resulted in one of them having good, strong foundations, and one of them not having good, strong foundations. The one built on sand, the other on um, rock. One is built on sand, the other is built on rock, correct. How come one of them is built on sand and one of them is built on rock? Hearing his words and doing them. Hearing his words and doing them. So what's the difference between the two men in that respect? One hears it and does not do it. One hears it and does Okay, thank you. One hears it and does not do it. One hears it and does do it. So they both hear. These men are both hearing the words of Jesus, not just listening, they're hearing. They're beginning to properly judge and discern what God is saying. They're hearing his words. The only difference is one of them acts on it and the other one doesn't. So we're, we're, do you see we're moving beyond the importance of simply being able to properly judge, to judge ourselves, to judge others, to judge situations. And we're moving into the importance of having judged properly. Now act upon what you have discerned. Those who hear Jesus' words, who take them in, who hear the word of God through the Holy Spirit and act on them, those are the ones building the house on the rock. Those who hear the words, discern them through the Holy Spirit, but then don't act on them, that's a house that's built on sand. Do you see how Jesus is pushing things here beyond purely judging correctly, discerning correctly? knowing who's a false prophet, who isn't, who's a false believer, who isn't, who's a false minister, who isn't, what's truth, what's falsehood. Moving beyond that into, okay, now act. Act on it. Faith, biblically speaking, always includes action. Faith is never purely a matter of a state of heart towards God. It's always a case of doing as well as believing. So we can... Take these words of Jesus about building your house on the rock. Jesus is speaking to his disciples and he's saying, look, disciples, everyone who hears my words and acts on them is like a man building on the rock. The storms will come. That life is going to stand strong. Everyone who doesn't do those words once they've heard and understood them is like someone building the house on the sand. The storms will come and the house will collapse. He's speaking to disciples and he's saying, look, if you properly discern by listening to the word of God, listening to the Holy Spirit and you act upon it, no matter what comes your way, all the challenges and trials and struggles and difficulties, setbacks, you're going to be strong and you're going to stand and it's going to be glorious. But if disciple... 
You hear and you judge correctly, but then you don't act upon what you've seen. Then when trials come, difficulties, struggles, challenges, there's going to be aspects in which your life, your, your walk is, going to, is not going to stand up to the pressure and it's going to cave in and it will be a great fall, you know. He's not saying you won't be a child of God anymore or you won't be saved. He's saying that your ability to stand in the midst of the challenge that comes your way will be compromised. Now, when you think about it, the wide gate, the broad road that leads to destruction that's destructive is the road that most people are on. It's the easy road of making easy, quick judgments about things and not listening to the Holy Spirit. And it's always destructive. Judging by appearances instead of by the heart. Always destructive. But the entrance way into making good, proper judgments through the word of God and the Holy Spirit is a narrow way. It's a hard road to, to keep walking with what you know God is, is saying. And very few are on that road. But it always brings life. But if your road is a narrow one and there's few on it, that's hard to live in the middle of a world where there's a broad road with loads on it, including Christians who aren't judging properly. It's a hard road. You have to have a strong foundation. You have to build on rock and not sand. So don't just discern correctly. Always act on what you see. Yes, Dan? So we're at verse 28. Victor, if you can read 28 to 29, please. And when Jesus finished this sentence, the crowds were astonished at his teaching, for he was teaching there as one who had authority and not as their scribes. Thank you. When Jesus finished these sayings, the crowds were astonished at his teaching, for he was teaching them as one who had authority and not as their scribes. I love how it says when Jesus had finished these sayings. It's almost like they've been so caught up listening to him, they haven't really had time to process how astonishing it all is. But he gets to the end and he shuts his mouth and they are astonished. They are amazed at what they hear. Why? Because he was teaching as one who had authority and not as their scribes. There's the difference. Their scribes, their teachers of God's word, who would write down God's word and copy it, communicate it. They would communicate the words, but there was no authority there. What was missing? What do you think was missing? Uh, conviction and living it, actually living it out. Conviction and actually living it out. A heart that's truly for God. And we can add then into that the Holy Spirit. We can take the word of God, this Bible, if we try and use it without the teaching and leading and guiding and, and the illumination that the Holy Spirit gives us, then it lacks authority. It can fall far short of a living word that transforms and changes. But if we put the two together, the word and the spirit of God, and we tune into both, then there's authority there. And we can do that if our heart is for God and we want to know him and do his will. So I think we'll sum up this bit now. I want to just therefore underline and re-emphasize. He's telling us how to discern those who are false prophets, look at their fruits, and those who are false believers, false ministers. Again, in a way, look at their fruits. Where's the love? Where's the open heart towards God in their ministry? It all has to come back down to that. What's their heart towards God? And just to illustrate quickly, um, I remember being 18 years old, sat just outside Shrewsbury School looking down over the town, and I wrote a song, a poem song, from my heart. I, it went like this. I'd rather know you than minister. I'd rather know you than write books. I'd rather know you than build a church. I'd rather know you than win the world. So turn my eyes to, G to you, Lord. Turn my eyes back to you, Jesus. And that was really what was in my heart, was Jesus, I would rather know you than anything else. I want that relationship. I don't, I'm not looking for, you know, to minister or to build churches or to win the world for you. I want to know you and I want you to know me. And I believe that's what he looks for. 
And that's what he finds. I think each one of us here is here tonight because we want to know him and we want him to know us, which is the emphasis in this passage. He wants to know us. He wants our hearts to be, to be wide open before him, which is why he honors us by teaching us how to judge correctly, how to discern between right and wrong, good and evil, truth and falsehood in these, in these days. And then the second point I'd just like to make is we came towards the end of this passage and we looked at the fact that it's one thing to discern correctly, it's another thing to then act on what we see. How action is crucial if we're going to be strong. I had an email this week from a a good friend who uh, God has called him to preach on the streets. He lives uh, in another part of the country. He's a young guy. And uh, he wrote to me and he said, you know, the Lord's um, put on my heart to preach in these certain towns where he said, I've never seen anyone preaching on the streets there before. He said, but I've not been, I've not done it yet. It's been a while. And he said, would you pray that God will put some hammer blows to the rock of inactivity in my heart? And I called him and I said, well, firstly, are you sure that God has put on your heart to preach in these places? He said, yeah, I just don't know why I haven't gone out there yet. You know, it's been a long time that I've felt this in my heart and I don't know why I've not gone out there yet. And I talked to him for a while and then I said, well, there's only one solution to inactivity and that's activity. God put this on your heart, go and do it. Just do it. He's what, he's put it on your heart to do. Just don't make any excuses, just go and do it and he'll be with you. And he was very grateful. Thank you so much, you know. And so uh, we see what God's saying to us. We hear, you know, at times how he's leading us. And there's only really one thing to do then, and that's to take action on it, which Jesus is obviously encouraging us to do here. So with all that background of encouraging us, ask for the Holy Spirit. Be filled with the Spirit. Make good judgments based on the Word and the Spirit of God. He sums it up by saying, and then act on what you see, take action. And there's a lot of authority in Jesus in in saying those things because he himself is acting on what the Spirit is putting in his heart. Well, let's pray, shall we? Lord, we thank you for your word and your Spirit's leading. Uh, Lord, we thank you that in these very complex times that we live in, uh, you don't want us to be obsessed with all the lies that are being spoken and you certainly don't want us to be afraid or timid about all the different things that come our way and that are coming the way of of this society, Lord. You don't want us to be even focused on those things. You want us to be focused on you. So, Lord, keep our eyes on you and continue to help us, Lord, just to open our hearts to you moment by moment and let that relationship with you, that glorious relationship, be, be developed and grow. And we know, Lord, that as we do and as we're listening to you, Lord, we will have all the discernment that we need, Lord, to see what you're saying and what you're doing, and Lord, to base all that we do on that. So Lord, strengthen us and all your people in our walk with you, Lord, in being led by the Holy Spirit, and uh, may Jesus be ever bigger in our perception day by day. In Jesus' name, amen.